are, but the exciting thing is that she's just started to call, so she's making contact calls. So I wonder if we're not going to see little balls of fluff hopefully come bounding through this long grass. And wouldn't that be so exciting if tiny little cubs come out? I'm so incredibly excited for us. I'm hoping that they do come out. She's calling, but it's not sort of very excitable calling just yet. It's not almost as if she's right on top of the cubs and she's stressed. She's just making soft calls at this stage. Now she's gone quiet now, but I'm hoping she is going to start again. She makes these soft little calls and I'm wondering if maybe she hasn't been hiding the cubs in really long grass like this. It's a perfect place to hide a little leopard cub in a thicket in long grass. It's going to be so difficult for anything to find them. And it seems that she's almost going back to sleep again. Mm -hmm. There we go. You're calling your little cubs. Wouldn't it be incredible if we get to see them? So you hear that? So that's her calling the cubs, isn't this special? Now hopefully they do come, like I say, if these are her cubs and this is where she's hidden them, these cubs are probably not even, I would say, a month old, which is going to be really interesting. Nobody's actually seen her with tiny little cubs. Just like I say, it was a report that she did have suckle marks so these must be still very small. The interesting thing though is if she is calling them because she's got a carcass and she wants to take them to meet, it's a little bit surprising to me because if they're this small, they shouldn't really be going to meet just yet. It's normally only about three months that they start getting taken to carcasses. So maybe they're a little bit older than we think. She's so beautiful. So, Riti, you're asking at what age will a leopard cub be able to hunt an animal all on her own or all on their own? Well, it depends on the size of the animal, but if we take Shongile and Hosanna, who are the two royal cubs that we've been seeing a lot lately, and those are Ula's cubs, they're now 14 months old and they're actually hunting for themselves. Hosanna's already killed a fully grown male impala, so they, once they start sort of getting to 14 months, they actually become quite efficient at hunting. But the youngest kill that I've ever seen a leopard make was a female that is in the west called Tiani. She was four months old when she killed her first baby Daika, which is pretty insane. Now that baby Daika was chased by mom first and cornered by mom. So it's not, I suppose not her own hunt. She just made, just killed the animal, but at least it shows you that that instinct is there already from four months old. So. I would say generally though you start to see them killing bigger prey items from sort of 14 months to two years that sort of area is when they start to have success with the bigger antelope species she's still calling now there are some other guests that are joining us that you can hear seem to be having a very good time on their vehicle there's lots of laughter coming this way so i'm hoping that they're going to stay nice and quiet mm. because if she does have little cubs those small cubs would be this will be the first time they've ever seen a vehicle and they're going to be quite nervous and shy and so you're going to end up with a situation where they won't come out if there's too much noise we need to be nice and quiet and just see what happens and if we do get a sighting of the cubs we'll then restrict the number of vehicles in the sighting and one of us will make space so that we don't pressure them too much it's really interesting behavior from Nkanyeni. Norwegian feminists, you're wondering if a male leopard would kill cubs that are not his own. Well, yes, they do. So I've seen Tingana kill a number of cubs. I've seen it happen multiple times with other males as well. So they do do it. The interesting thing though has been with Inkanyeni, it's she's had a very interesting last year because Shivambalano is the father of Batumi or the suspected father of Batumi and then quarantine came in and kind of kicked Shivambalano out of this territory and has actually been seen with Batumi a few times which is strange because it's not his cub but maybe it's because he was kind of at the size where he was not really a threat as a male but he was big enough not to be seen as a, a small cub that was going to bring the female back into estrus and so he just kind of let it slide but generally if male leopards come across very young cubs they will kill them if they're not their own or if they had never mated with that female it also then brings into question is maybe quarantine actually did mate with Inkanyeni, just nobody witnessed it and that's why he's been okay with this male but most of the time in my experience male leopards will kill the cubs to bring the female back into estrus but the exciting thing is, is if this Inkanyeni has new cubs, then those cubs, in all 
likelihood are quarantines, which would mean that it would be quarantine's first litter that he's had with a female because he's only just started mating with them. And so about three months ago, he was mating with Nkanyeni. So the timeline does fit. And it would be amazing if that bloodline of Karulas can continue, especially given the fact that she's missing at the moment and has not been seen in a few months. Any kind of time where we get that continuation of that genetics is always an exciting time. So it would be quite fitting if we got two new little cubs if Karula did indeed has gone missing. You can see she's looking around. So John B from Colorado, I would take it, since it was in your Twitter handle. Um, you're wondering if, why would she be calling if not for her cubs? Well, it's not that she wouldn't be calling. So what I'm, when I'm saying that she might not be calling for the new cubs, she might be calling Vatumi, who's the older cub, and he has been seen in this area. So it might not be new cubs that she's calling. Um, but she wouldn't call like this for anything else. There's no other way that a female leopard calls in this manner. This is a contact call for cubs only. She doesn't use this for anything else. If she was looking for a male and she wanted to call a male, she would be full rasping, sawing that leopards do. Um, so this is a contact call for cubs. They don't make the sound for any other reason whatsoever. So she's looking for the cubs and is calling them. And if the cubs don't respond, you'll find that she'll get more and more desperate with her calling and it will get more and more frantic and she'll stride up and down into the area where she last had them to try and see if they can find them. But you can see she's just watching us from behind the tree. Hasn't she got the most beautiful eyes? Such a pretty animal. What an incredible afternoon we've had, Seb. Yeah, what do you think? Incredible. So Zaz, they know their mom's call just because they hear it from the day that they're born. It's like us. As babies, we start to hear our mother's voice from the day that we're born and even before that. And we then learn that that's our mom's voice. So each leopard, even though to us as humans sounds very similar to the leopard cub, it will know straight away that's my mom calling and it knows when those sounds are being made that it needs to come to its mother. So that's why they know what it is. It's exactly like humans. We can recognize each other's voices it's the same with leopards. Remember, their hearing is far superior to what ours is. And so even though we might be struggling to hear, their hearing might just pick it up and they know exactly what's going on. But it, what is interesting is if these are brand new cubs, I'm a little bit surprised that they haven't come out already because she would have gone to the exact place where she left them and normally where they leave them when they're still so small, they don't move around at all. When they get a little bit older, they tend to be a bit adventurous and they'll go into thickets and they'll move around quite a bit and then it takes a lot longer to find them. But when they're still very small, generally they're in a kind of den which is either a sort of thicket or a rocky outcrop or a sort of hole in a river bank or a termite mound and they go to that spot and they call and that cub normally comes very quickly because remember, the cub is hungry so it wants mom to come back, it wants to suckle, it wants to find mom and so when that they call like this they normally respond quite quickly so it's interesting that she's calling and nothing has arrived yet but she doesn't seem too stressed I've seen mothers when they call and they're worried about their cubs then they start really going up and down and the calling becomes more and more frantic and louder and louder and louder as they try and search for this individual so hopefully the cubs are not too far and they're just a little bit shy with us around and over time they'll eventually get over the shyness of the vehicle and hopefully then emerge somewhere in this area and we get a glimpse of them now, it's going to be very difficult to spot a leopard cub in this anyway if it does come out. As you can see, we can barely see an adult fully grown female. Now, you can imagine a tiny little ball of fluff trying to bound around through thickets like this. We really are going to struggle to see them. But it'll be amazing because when you, when they normally, when mom calls them and they hear it, then they start to call back and we'll hear that sound of them trying to talk to their mom and then they try and get over the long grass and they kind of fall and it is very, very cute to watch tiny baby leopard cubs or lion cubs trying to negotiate long grass like this. So I'm hoping that they will appear and that we will get lucky. The other problem we have is that time is not on our side. As soon as it gets dark, if she's calling for cubs that are fairly new, then we're going to have to leave her alone because we can't be here in the dark. Often things like hyenas, lions, they see the lights of the vehicle and they're going to come into this area and check out what's going on. So if the cubs do emerge, unfortunately, we're not going to have too much time with them. So we're going to have to just hope that they make a miraculous appearance in the next sort of 15, 20 minutes and we'll then get lucky and be able to see them. But isn't that amazing, that camouflage? 
Absolutely incredible. And it is so, so special to sit with a leopard like this and to listen to it calling. This, as a guide, this sound, when they make this, it makes the hairs on your body stand up because you get so excited about the potential of seeing a cub and all of us out here, doesn't matter what guide you speak to, seeing a leopard cub is one of those priceless moments in anybody's life. And so when they start calling like this, the excitement levels just get crazy and you get so, so into the sighting. It really is quite amazing. Right, we're going to stay for a little bit longer. And as I was saying, it is starting to get dark. So Taylor is on her way back home so that she doesn't get eaten by anything while she's out on foot. So I think she would like to say goodbye to all of you and we'll stay with Fatumi and hopefully we'll have some surprises when you get back. So we followed her through and I had a moment where I thought that she had picked up a cub in her mouth and was walking and I was super excited because she was calling but she's actually got a, something that she's eating and I can't see what it is. There's something between her paws that she's busy feeding on but it kind of looked like a cub curled up in the gloominess of the sunset and so I was trying to see what it was but I can't see there. I don't know Sebastian if you can see from where you are but I don't. But she still is calling so I'm hoping that maybe these little ones do pop out somewhere here. That would be really quite amazing if they did. Now the other bit of interesting news is that I believe somebody has just found quarantine as well, not too far from here. So if she does go in or cubs do arrive, we'll probably have to leave her because it's now getting very dark. You can see I've got my lights on now just to be able to see her. So then we'll try and see if we can't go and see quarantine, which would just round out the most spectacular afternoon on cheetah plains as they say it doesn't always it rains it pours and it is definitely pouring for sebastian and i this afternoon there's been the cheetah and this Nkanyeni who's been so special she's moved a little bit she's called and she's now at least in a little bit of a better position where we can see her but i wonder what she's got there whatever it is is very small and uh, sebastian says he thinks it might be a bird and that could be they often do hunt things like Franklins and maybe it came across a little chick that it's grabbed, but I can't see at all what it is. Now I'm hoping that she might pick it up again like she did just now and I'll be able to see what it is exactly. But whatever it is, it's, it's very small. It's not a massive meal. There we go. Maybe we can see now, Seb. If we go in a little bit closer. I'm trying to see if I can't see some feathers. Yeah, there's some feathers. Ah, so Jamie, I believe, was answering a question from Lucian about would a domestic cat survive in the bush? Well, Lucian, I think it's possible. Um, there are domestic cats that have been seen. Brent has seen a domestic cat in the Sabi Sands quite far from any camp, and so it's obviously making its way around and, and surviving some way. I think it would be very difficult. I think, unfortunately, unfortunately, it, it's a not an easy place to survive with all the predators that are out here. Um, there's not only these leopards and lions and hyenas, there's also birds of prey, there's snakes, and if a domestic cat has not grown up with any sort of knowledge of that, there will be an inherent sort of, um, what's the word I'm looking for, a, a sort of knowledge that there are dangerous things out here, and, and, and a sort of, there'll be an instinct to avoid predation, but because they don't know these things, they might get themselves into a little bit of trouble. And also, the, the wild cats that we get out here, which is very similar to a domestic cat, is just so much stronger and more powerful than a normal domestic cat that I just don't see a domestic cat living a long life out here unless it adapts very, very quickly. But I suppose it is possible. Now, after a good meal, you have to ease the itch. So, near leopards don't go into false pregnancy. I've never seen a leopard in false pregnancy. They're either pregnant or they're not. But in terms of false estrus, yes, they can go into false estrus. I've seen leopards going into false estrus where they mate with males just to get the males sort of used to the fact that they are around and that they are trying to protect possibly cubs that they do have at the time. So it does sometimes happen that they will go into false estrus. But it's very, I've never in my life heard of a leopard going into a false pregnancy. Um, sometimes you'll find a leopard gets pregnant and then it's, oh, 
forgot about our little bar that sticks out there. Um, our leopard goes, gets pregnant and then loses the cubs for some reason, and that does happen, but I've never seen a false pregnancy. Now, unfortunately, I don't think we're going to be able to go any further here. I'm going to try and see if I can just get through, but I don't think so. I think we've probably hit a dead end here, Sebastian. And it is getting very dark, and with her calling, I'm worried. I don't want to attract too much attention and bring hyenas into this area and threaten if she does have new little cubs. So what I think I'm going to do is probably leave this beautiful Inconyeni alone. We do know where she is now, and maybe it's worth just coming in the morning. The cubs could potentially be out, and we don't have to then worry about attracting too much attention during the day as we do at night. So I think I'm going to leave her here. You can see how thick it is in front of me. The grass is so long. So while we kind of get out of this area and leave Inconyeni to her own devices, let's go across to Jamie and see how her search for the nocturnal critters is going.